Hey everybody, it is um, Thursday, October 27th at about 1 p.m. Um, I have been wanting to make this video for a while and just found the time this afternoon. Um, I, uh, I've been, been thinking a lot about um, female-only or male-only spaces and, and how that impacts me personally as, as a trans man. Um, but then I'm also wondering how maybe it is not an individual experience and maybe it impacts um, both trans men and women and gender non-conforming people at large. So um, I know that my experience with um, gender specific spaces is quite different now than it used to be prior to my transition. Um, I very much honor and respect gender specific or gender, gender segregated spaces when it's purposeful um, and when there's specific meaning in it. Um, so it's not that I am foundationally opposed to them, um, but I am opposed to them um, being created or being implemented without thorough thought and, and sort of investigation as to the purpose of why that's happening. Um, there's been a handful of things um, recently in my life, or, or maybe it's not recent, maybe I'm just paying more attention to it, that have been um, gender segregated. And it's interesting because those are spaces that I used to be invited into and welcomed into to participate and to share. Um, and now, uh, as a trans man, I'm no longer invited or welcome into those spaces, yet I still hold all of the experiences and memories um, and insights that I ha held before that allowed me to participate in those spaces. Um, so. So conversely, um, now I would be invited into male-only spaces, but I don't have the experiences and the stories and the perspectives and the insights um, to adequately or equally share in male-only spaces thus far. I, I, I just don't have enough experience or time um, as a... Um, as a man, as an externally presenting man to be able to, to contribute um, as compared to 30 years of um, being read as a female. So it's a very interesting thing and, and what it's left me is feeling kind of a void of, because um, you don't very, well I don't know that it ever really exists, of trans only spaces, um, you know maybe like support groups or, or things like that, but overwhelmingly um, certainly not in rural areas and in, in Chico, California, I don't know of any trans only spaces and, and, um, and even if there were a trans only space, um, the handful of people that would be there, uh, is really quite different than when you are in a female only or male only space when you are around, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, a hundred other people. So, um, it's just sort of kind of got me in this, this, this place of, of kind of a quandary of, um, where is, where do I fit into with regards to a binary system when um, gender specific or segregated spaces are being created? Um, I get that I physically can't go into a FEMA, FEMA only space and physically fit in there, um, but I can spiritually and emotionally and, and, um, and in many ways socially fit in there much better than I can male only spaces. Um, I would anticipate this being different 10 years from now as I have more time um, as an experienced man. Um, but even so, I guess I still question, uh, it, you know, if I have 30, lived, 30 years of lived experience um, as being understood as female and being gendered as female, and in many ways, um, I know it's sort of, you're not supposed to in some ways acknowledge or talk about this, but... Um, I didn't, for those 30 years prior to my transition, didn't concretely hard-lined um, identify myself as a man. I, moreover, didn't identify myself, identify myself as a female. So it's not even like in those spaces I had this internal awareness of I'm a man in this female-only space. Um, what I had was I'm a different kind of person than what appears to be presenting itself with all these other all these other women. and. Um, and so it's not to say that I don't have a strong male identity. I do, uh, but I have a strong male identity in regards to a binary system, um, operating outside of a binary system. I 
have a very strong male identity and a very strong f lived female experience. Um, and I find most comforts identifying as a man and certainly without a doubt, most comfort is being read and understood as male, but, um, but as a trans man, um, I don't seek out and particularly enjoy being in spaces where I am assumed to be a cis man. Um, that is not right now, uh, this place in my life and my transition is not my home community. Um, so this sort of ties into the idea. I was, I had a very brief conversation with some, um, during a class presentation about, and I've mentioned this numerous times in previous videos. So clearly it's something that I experience a lot, um, is in some ways kind of a perpetual cycling in and out of different stages of grief. And certainly depending upon where I'm at, where probably we all are, we all are in regards to our medical, social, and physical transition, um, the things that we are grieving and the angst that we're feeling uh, changes. Certainly the angst that I felt prior to physically transition is very different than the angst that I feel now. Um, my level of comfort is has drastically increased as compared to prior to my transition. But so I'm finding that I'm, I'm grieving things that I couldn't even um, reach before, such as um, never being able to father my own children, which I've I mentioned before, uh, which is a socially sort of constructed thing because um, there's no guarantees, even if you're a cis man, that you're going to be able to father your own child. And I get that. Um, but certainly the likelihood of you being able to father your own child as a cis man is much, much higher. Uh, I think that we would all agree to that. Um, but, um, you know, there's sort of constant things that come up with um, just life. Um, family emergencies. I had a, a situation where a family member who was somewhat removed, I cared deeply about him, but um, was, was having a crisis. And uh, a lot of the people around him didn't really know what to do or how to support him. And as a social worker and somebody who's been involved in systems, I was the I was best positioned to provide some help and some support. But he doesn't know me. He doesn't know Aiden. He knows this. He knows of, of this this woman, and and she is not physically around. And in the midst of a psychological mental health crisis, um, how do I find? How do I navigate a place? to to be a source of support for him and his family when without it being all about me being trans and I'm Aiden now and male pronouns and you know and so so like so I, I had to make decisions about that and I had to try to figure out how to navigate that and I don't know that I did it the best way um, it's such a learning process but there was grief in that there was grief in the sense that I my story and my experience doesn't allow me just to just to um, to show up and and be supportive and not to have sort of all this additional baggage that kind of gets gets put at, at everybody's feet um, <clears throat> so I think that you know like that's a recent example and, and not being able to father my children and um, you know like I, I, I think there's just a thousand examples um, this is not sort of me this is not me occupying a place of like pity or poor me or I hate being trans at all. It's more about the acknowledgement and continued um, journey of transition that is well past the physicality of transition and even and even to some degree sort of moving out of the social aspects of transition. Um, I navigate my world socially relatively well um, and, and I get that part of the reason why I can do this is because I have a lot of privilege which I, I mentioned in a previous video but so now this is more maybe the final stages of identity development um, or one of the final stages of de identity development is is really coming to terms with what it means in the long haul or for the long haul um, to be trans. Um, what it means macro in a very large sort of systems and what it means very micro interpersonally with my families, uh, my family dynamics and family situations. and. Although I have tremendous family support, there are going to be, there have been and there are going to continue to be times in which it's difficult to navigate that um, because I'm trans. So um, I think that it's a very interesting place for me to have arrived at um, realizing that for my entire life I felt like I didn't fit in and I didn't belong anywhere. 
and the thing that prevented me from, I thought, that prevented me from feeling like I fit in or belonged was because I was trans and needed to transition. And so um, into my, approaching my you know, three and a half, four years into transition, um, there is a familiarity with the feeling of not fitting in, except it's a very different side of the coin now of, um, I, I, you know, I still don't fit in. And, and what, what relationship can I build with that? Um, because, uh, I think that, you know, that there's a challenge there. The, there's the grieving of never, potentially never fitting in. I, I can't make promises about tomorrow or the next day, but, but there's, there's grief that's associated with realizing and knowing that I still, I still don't feel like I fit in in many ways. And, um, and how much of that will change as I change and grow is that, um, a projection of my insecurity or is that just a facet of my reality uh, so um, thanks for listening as always and um, hope everyone is doing well love to hear your comments or your thoughts your experiences with the idea of gender segregated spaces and how you navigate that um, and the idea of are we as trans folk and maybe many many other marginalized or oppressed communities are we truly in a perpetual state of grief and sort of cycling in and out of different things, uh, different stages at different times for different reasons. So, okay. Bye.